good time. Um, so if Vaslov, if you would like to share your screen. Um, I, I should say our first two speakers today got up very bright and early and did a fantastic job uh, as they were in quite different time zones. We're now, we're now moving east as we go through our, our speaker list. And so Vaslov will give us a nice talk from Prague. Okay, um, thank you, Andrew. Uh, actually, thank you for inviting me and organizing this mini symposium. I think it's going very well um, so far. Um, okay, so um, my talk will be more about questions than answers, I guess, and perhaps I will stir up the discussion uh, rather than giving you answers. So um, I was not sure how much should I uh, go into details about reviewing classical Turing instability, but I'll give for reasons that will be apparent later on some review. It, it will be surely subjective, but we will see how that will uh, go. So the concept of diffusion-driven instability um, goes back to Turing, as, as we probably all consider it that way but that I would say it's more about mathematics. So initially diffusion or intuitively diffusion is considered as a smearing out process, but Turing showed perhaps some, something counterintuitive. Uh, certain type of reactions to diffusions, um, to diffusion, you can actually um, observe that a certain type of structures might appear. Hence, that's the notion of diffusion-driven instability or Turing instability. It led to a, a huge area of mathematical biology um, and really extensive research. Um, I'll briefly mention how these Turing uh, instability uh, conditions are made. But what I would like to draw more attention to is, say, alternative approach to these type of emergent structures. And that goes back to uh, Prigozhin, who, who is um, um, more physics, I would say, person than mathematical one. Um, but he looked at dissipative structures in, in a very different perspective, although there are some common features. And what I would like to show you is that this perhaps surprising effect of uh, reactions adding to diffusion uh, is that it's not actually surprising at all uh, from certain perspective that I would like to show you. And uh, if we follow this idea, say, uh, a little bit beyond what Prigozhin did, or just follow those ideas, we may end up with a little bit different models than the classical reaction diffusion ones that we are aware of. So uh, instead of uh, starting with these typical examples uh, ranging from development biology, uh, for reasons that I will come to later, um, I prefer, say, more controlled environment like um, coming from physics or chemistry like this really banal convection cells. So it's similar phenomena like self-organization self in nature and how it emerges. So it's um, a silicon oil heated from below and eventually if the temperature gradient is large enough, these nice convective uh, uh, regular sh type shapes will appear um, and this inner structure with a stable flow will form. Okay, so what what do we mean by Turing instability? We heard three very nice talks uh, that uh, went well beyond what Turing had in mind uh, in his initial ideas, um, but perhaps it's it's good for um, our purpose here to to review what he had in mind. So for simplicity, let's start with just with a system of two reaction diffusion equations subjected to say zero flux boundary conditions. Um, then what we mean by diffusion driven instability is a transition of a stable homogeneous steady state into an unstable state once diffusion is added. Um, I'll come back to this point later why we should be um, interested in this transition of having stable homogeneous steady state. So something like a stable state when diffusion is off when diffusion is not playing a role in the system, and why should we be interested in emergence of a pattern in a situation once we add or switch on diffusion? 
but let's keep that uh, as, a, as an assumption or as a plausible hypothesis, hypothesis for, for now. Now, given we have that steady state, which is stable, um, and we carry out linearized, uh, linearization of the system and then later on stability, we can come to a very nice um, answer to the question of whether uh, this self-organization can appear or not. And in terms of four inequalities, which are listed down here below, uh, but they're algebraic inequalities. So it's a very nice, I would say, a result, theoretical result from a quite complex system of PDEs that you can come up to come up with uh, four uh, inequalities, which are very, very simple when compared to the original problem. And once you satisfy these equations, you know that uh, instab linear instability will play a role and hopefully um, linearities will um, take over to stabilize the unbounded growth. Okay, so there are some uh, uh, well-known issues. Um, I'm surely not listing all of them, but those who I thought are important. So uh, the, one of the main ones, main difficulties with uh, uh, Turing idea of instability is that it requires a quite large ratio of diffusion coefficients in the diffusion terms. Uh, that's quite surprising when you keep in mind that there are certain uh, or certain relations should be, should be satisfied um, between diffusion coefficients and uh, the size of the say molecules or the, uh, the morphogens that are moving around. Um, so is this uh, requirement um, uh, a strict say difficulty or is, is it a, a drawback for the model or, or is it solvable? And actually um, using a very similar technique that we saw in the first three lectures, you can show that if you add additional species or uh, another ones uh, corresponding to say bound state of the two morphogens that we are tracking now and assume that the binding and, and unbinding with the say background like ECM is fast enough, you can show that you can get rid of this uh, uh, inequality of diffusion coefficients very quickly. So to be more explicit, let's take the original system we had where we have linear kinetics already uh, and add uh, species W, which would correspond to a bound state of, of the morphogen U. Uh, bound, bounded means that it doesn't diffuse and it's bound into the background. And if these K plus and K minus coefficients are fast, we can show using, uh, again, asymptotics, uh, looking at higher order quasi state assumption, that it actually leads to a rescaling of the, the time derivative of of the U, of the one who has two state bounded and unbounded states. And, and as this ratio K plus over K minus, it has to have uh, a certain sign. You can show that it leads to just rescaling of your uh, linearization of the kinetics and your diffusion coefficient. So it's actually very easy to see what are the consequences of such uh, uh, binding and unbinding of our two morphogens that we are tracking and you would just rescale your four algebraic equations, uh, which are those uh, DDI con diffusion driven instability conditions. Um, and because we know exactly what the rescaling affects, what parameters it affects, you can see that it affects only one of the four inequalities, and namely uh, it's the trace of J being, uh, being less than zero. So uh, importantly, we don't require anymore that the diffusion coefficients have to be of different order or they don't have to be actually uh, different at all. Uh, I should know that uh, this seems to be a positive um, resolution of the problem, but it relates to a more uh, general problem, which I would call a reduction problem of reductionism. And that is model predictions are very sensitive to how many uh, morphogens or how many 
So if you imagine um, a biological problem where really uh, the simplification just to two or two partial differential equations is a great simplification for sure. Um, uh, if we add um, some details in terms of another another partial differential equation in in the system, we could uh, change the prediction in in a very dramatic way. Actually, they they can be very uh, exactly opposite uh, from from reality. Okay, uh, we're speaking about linear theory, um, and perhaps people would view that as as um, well understood and everything is clear, but I would like to pause for a, a for a few minutes here that it's actually not so. So typically the linear analysis goes uh, like that. Uh, we we consider first just the special operator with given boundary conditions. Look at uh, the um, eigen modes. So what are the um, functions which constitute the orthonormal basis? then expand the solution in this orthonormal basis and look at the evolution equations for the amplitudes. This gives us the dispersion which uh, connects the, uh, the time evolution uh, with the spatial problem. But if you step back for a moment, um, the actual problem, um, uh, uh, say as, as the problem as a whole, so if you would write down the linear operator for the whole system, for the system of two PDEs, you would see that uh, typically the linear operator is not only self-adjunct, but it's also non-normal. And the reason for that is the coupling in the, linear, in the linearization of the kinetics. Right? But you can easily show that if the uh, Jacobian is non, has non-normal matrix, then the full operator of the problem is non-normal. What that means is, uh, as you probably know, one should um, uh, take care about pseudo-spectrum ra rather than a spectrum itself. So spectrum doesn't, um, say, fully characterize the time evolution of the system. Namely, we can have a transient growth. This transient growth can be quite significant and um, <clears throat> If we, uh, just to illustrate the point, if we um, uh, denote by kappa the ratio of uh, uh, norm uh, of the solution to its initial norm at time zero, you can see that uh, a, a very strange effect uh, can appear. Not only that we have a transient growth and for, for large time, uh, the spectrum uh, takes over. So this is the case where um, uh, the spectrum is uh, purely in left half plane, uh, meaning uh, no pattern should appear. But still we observe uh, initial transient uh, growth and only eventually we have this exponential decay as the spectrum um, would predict. More importantly, um, uh, so lambda, I should say lambda delta, uh, corresponds to the um, eigenvalue of minus Laplacian for a very specific uh, illustrative mm, example. But the key point here is that for given time, a uh, different eigenmode is the one who is uh, growing the fastest. This is unlike in the um, classical understanding where we look only through the dispersion relation, you cannot have this effect any, anyhow. It's always one mode which is growing the fastest in, in the linear analysis, but here um, you can see that it is, it is not so. So if I pick a time, say 50 or 20 or whatever that is, the fastest growing mode is different than, uh, than in later times, and that changes throughout. Um, the say positive conclusion from this is that unless we are um, interested in uh, unless we think that fine parameter tuning is plausible um, uh, we sh we don't have to take care about uh, the subtleties too much so one can show that these high uh, 
uh, transient growing uh, regimes can have can appear only in the vicinity of the boundary of Turing um, um, Turing um, space. Okay, uh, another difficulty or another distinction in linear analysis that one should keep in mind is how we treat um, our domain size. So if we think about applications, mainly in biology, um, domain size is changing in time, actually. Like we saw in the uh, last talk, uh, if, if we have a moving boundary problem, it's quite different to what we have uh, to, to understanding when uh, the domain size is fixed. Um, recently, there is some program, uh, progress in the understanding of the distinction between growing domains and uh, once the domain size is uh, being fixed and thought about as, uh, uh, say, um, bifurcation parameter. And the distinction is quite dramatic. Uh, we can have history dependence of the Turing space just because of growth. Um, different types of growth uh, yield different Turing spaces. And actually, uh, one has a very similar um, effect as we saw before. So modes can actually transiently grow prior to decay. So immediately there is sensitivity to initial conditions and actually you can cook up explicit examples when, where you can uh, easily follow how um, for some growth rates, all modes actually with a high enough wave number transiently grow, uh, which means that you would um, end up with a problem that your description doesn't uh, make any sense. Um, and uh, very recently, uh, we were able to generalize, generalize these findings to a, a quite general setting, but still within the assumption of uniform, uniform domain growth. And uh, another example, which is very closely related to what we saw, uh, especially in the first two talks, is about the movement of the spike. So even if we look at the well-studied and well-understood, I think, Germ-Meinhardt kinetics, uh, very close to the shadow limit, uh, limit um, we can actually have uh, not only a traveling of spike as we saw uh, before and, and say stabilization of the spike, but if there is uh, a slight and I mean really it's a very shallow um, modulation of uh, parameters across the space, we can have this type of a complex periodic uh, motion appearing, which we were not able to understand, neither through, of course, linear analysis, but also not without uh, nonlinear analysis, uh, similar to what we saw before. Okay, but what I would most likely to talk about, and um, I hope I'll have enough time to go through that, is to use a different approach um, uh, to pause for a moment uh, about what type of equations and problems we are uh, we are studying right so we saw in the first three talks if you start your initial problem uh, with a, a very well defined uh, in, in a mathematical sense we can run very quickly into very problematic uh, uh, problems which uh, require fine tools just to be able to answer uh, problems like existence and stability uh, what I would like to show you now is that uh, I'm not even certain about the equations that we're opposing as a uh, in, in the in step if they're actually uh, the best ones we can think of. So this is something uh, you should all be familiar with. So I will go very quickly through it uh, just to give you the broad idea of what I mean by non-equilibrium thermodynamics and how it gives you a different a perspective or a different framework for uh, arriving to diffusion equation, for example, and how it can be generalized. So consider we have a given um, body with a discontinuity, but I would uh, disregard it for the moment. So a general balance law for an extensive property like uh, density is very easy to write down. Uh, so time change of uh, the given quantity, total quantity in a given system 
can have just two causes. Either there are some volumetric for sources or uh, there is some interaction uh, with uh, across the boundary via fluxes like we saw in the first talk. Now, we can uh, write down what are the uh, local form of valence law just using Gauss and Reynolds transform theorem to calculate the time derivative of, of the integrals. So this is what we have. And if we disregard the discontinuities, as I said before, uh, these are the typical form of local balance law, which you're surely familiar with. Now the key bit is what are the sources in our balance law and fluxes across the boundary. Once we know those, we, uh, we can write down uh, the balance law for that particular quantities. Now the easiest one is to start with mass, right? So mass, if we are talking about single species, so we have just a single continuum, uh, mass cannot be produced from nothing. So the sigma should be zero and flux um, uh, so again, mass cannot be generated uh, just by um, uh, flux, other than the one we have here, which is the convected part. So for mass, our balance equation is simple, also known as continuity equation. Um, if we do the similar arguments for linear momenta, uh, we can uh, easily come uh, to local balance for linear momenta. Um, so the source term uh, corresponds to forces, that's just Newton's law. And there is additional term corresponding to the interaction, what, what I call by fluxes, that's Cauchy stress. So that's exactly uh, the source of say forces in, in this uh, particular exa example, acting at the boundary. We can repeat the same thing for energy and with the particular choice of forces being uh, conservative, uh, we can write down the conservative, uh, the, the balance law for energy. Now, it's, it, these type of arguments have, uh, I think, appeal. Uh, all first principles are including. The question is, are, are we missing any uh, quantities um, of, of, uh, apart from the three I mentioned? But one should keep in mind is that uh, there is something very specific about the fields I just mentioned. And that is we actually know their conservation properties. We could easily identify what are the sources and fluxes. The problem is what happens when one wants to have a more complex model, uh, say with internal um, variables or some structural variables. So. I just posed the question, are we missing any? And actually, yes, we are angular momentum. So um, it's coming out from the symmetry argument of the Cauchy stress, um, and also it leads to identification of the two forces and fluxes. Now, there is one um, more uh, quantity uh, that is of particular importance, and that is entropy. Um, so we will invoke first and second law of thermodynamics uh, to come to a conclusion now. So we can write down what's the uh, balance equation for uh, entropy again. So there is this convective part, some flux of entropy across the boundary and uh, a source term. And the second law of thermodynamics in this setting can be translated just into a requirement that the source has to be non-negative. Uh, it acts as a time arrow, but that's something I would um, and has some relation to symmetries in the equations and method theorem, but I, I would skip that. So what about the first law? law? Is, is it uh, used there somewhere or not yet? Well, actually it was, it appeared in the uh, energy balance equation. Now, if we substitute some definition of, um, now we need some definition of entropy. We would use the typical one, this Gibbs definition of entropy. Um, it relates temperature, entropy, and energy. Uh, if we calculate time derivative of it, we have actually a um, time evolution of entropy in terms of internal variable and density. So we can now use all the balance equations and plug it in. And what we are left is, with is explicit term for uh, entropy production. In the setting, in the simple setting I, I used, 
you would end up with just these two terms here. So the first one is flux of heat times gradient of inverse temperature, and the other one is uh, dissipative part of, of Cauchy stress times uh, gradient of velocity. Now, how, what's the easiest uh, um, way how to satisfy this non-inequality? Say we don't have any velocity for a moment, so we have just the first term. You will see that the easiest uh, thing how to satisfy it is if we assume um, that heat flux is proportional uh, to gradient of inverse temperature. That's exactly Fourier law. If we do the same for the second term, uh, what we get is uh, uh, exactly a Newton a Newtonian fluid. And if we plug it in in the uh, balance equation, you will get a Navier-Stokes equation. So, um, right. If one uh, redoes the same analysis, the same arguments, but not just with one continuum, but having n continuum, uh, you can get uh, you can uh, get a more complex uh, you can get a more complex uh, expression for entropy production. Um, you would recognize the two terms we had, but there are additional ones like uh, diffusion uh, and corresponding to gradient of chemical potential and uh, uh, activity and reaction rates. So now we have not only the Fourier heat's law we had, but also a fixed diffusion law, uh, which is hidden here. So gradient of chemical potential can be um, uh, related to gradient of concentration. And actually what we had in uh, the last talk, uh, which was the reaction diffusion Stefan problem, that's exactly replacing the gradient of concentration by gradient of chemical potential, which is more appropriate. Sorry, I'm running out of time uh, quite a lot, so th there is uh, a lot more to be said. Uh, but crucially, uh, what this gives you is a way how to extend the idea of uh, just having diffusion or just having uh, chemical reactions and putting them together. If one re redoes this argument, you can get actually um, an observation that you don't only have the diffusion contribution and the classical chemical uh, reactions in terms of affinities, but you also have to consider a contribution from advection as a necessity. So um, like one a natural extension is to have not only diffusion and reactions, but also to have advection. And the simplest case is to consider advection with uh, a constant term there. And I'm sorry, I'm really over my time here. Um, so I'll just jump to the um, con say conclusions, observations from there. Um, if we look at this reaction diffusion advection problem um, and, and carry out the same or the classical linear, linear stability analysis, um, we observe that there are uh, now a very significant uh, role of boundary conditions and uh, how large is the constant advection. And even there are situations where there is a distinct um, difference whether advection is present, even though small, or whether advection is absent, um, especially in certain boundary conditions. I'm, I'm very happy to go into uh, further details in this in discussions, but I'm uh, running out of time. So in conclusions in short, uh, we don't have, I think, uh, a, um, say, possible model for self-organization yet, which would be applicable to wide uh, situations or applications in nature. Uh, there are certain frameworks which can be used for looking at possible extensions, um, but surely we have to be very careful with uh, what we mean uh, by that. Once we have the correct equations, we have to be very specific and, and thorough in our mathematical analysis. There is, of course, uh, uh, a positive relation to that. Uh, we have uh, things that we can look at and, and uh, work, work on.
So thank you very much for your attention and that will be all. Thank you very much, Vassal. Yeah, it's quite a short bit of time to really talk about uh, difficult and provocative things. Um, again, if there are any questions, please put them in the Q&A. Um, I'll, I'll again start with a very rude question, which is, do you, do you have any thoughts on how to extend not just the transport mechanisms and the sort of conservative laws, but how we can make sense of many distinct components, so many chemical species really beyond two and three species systems? Uh, so so th that's one of the things I mentioned in the introductory part where I perhaps spent too much time, is that this prob problem of reductionism. I actually think that um, uh, that's an issue which we cannot uh, get away from, and even this framework doesn't help. Um, it, it does make a significant, it does play a significant role how many details we, we add in. So this type of structural stability uh, is not in reaction diffusion problems, at least to my understanding. And uh, adding um, uh, or ad addition of advection at, at least uh, doesn't, doesn't help as, as far as I know, but that's definitely not the only possible extension one can make. So, uh, for example, now I'm working on a different extension which uh, suggests that one should have not only a diffusion terms like a Laplacian we have or like the Stefan term we saw earlier, but also a term corresponding to a square of gradient of concentration. But that's uh, something I cannot talk too much about. I have not, not much experience there. 